Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to another fantastic session of OLC 40 Term 2B, brought to you by Wassa Distance Education Center. I am your instructor, Mike Laverty, and today's date is Wednesday, April the 26th, 2023. Today marks class number seven of OLC 40 Term 2B, and we are covering Unit 1, Lesson 1. Uh, sorry, uh, that's Unit 1, Lesson 2. So we're on to Lesson 2 in this course. And we're going to be talking about Assignment 6, 7, and 8. So we will be beginning our discussion of our novel, Jimmy Comes Home. Uh, hopefully I'll have enough time here. I can read a bit of the novel on the airwaves and yeah, we can we can jump into that discussion. So I'm hoping that you've taken the time to to read a bit of the novel and if you haven't, then this will be your first taste. Here's some important dates to keep in mind. I'll keep reminding you of these dates for you know at least a few more weeks and I'll I'll add some other ones as they come up. So just want to let everyone know that potential grads, your deadline for submitting work is June the 9th. So if you think you're on pace for graduating, you have to have that work in by June the 9th. So if you're maybe one credit or two credits away, and OLC 4.0 might potentially be one of your final credits to obtain, then you have to have that all the coursework in by June 9th. Other students, you've got a deadline of June 16th for submitting work in this chorus. So if, you, if you're not a potential grad, if you think you'll be coming back next year to get some more credits, then you have that deadline of June 16th. And if you can't make that deadline of June 16th, then you can register for the summer term. And during the summer term, we're not broadcasting any classes, and you won't have um, a teacher to consult but you can still submit work over the summer and there'll be markers available to to mark your work and then you know we'll and then you'll, you'll there's a separate deadline for that which I can update you on later but just just keep those deadlines in mind you know if you want to complete your work in this school year and it's important to note that you can't pass your school year you can't uh, you can't pass on your school year <laughs> sorry you can't pass your work on to the next school year. So the work you've done this school year, um, you could push into the summer, but you can't push it any farther than that. And then, and then that's where it becomes, you know, um, yeah, you have to like start from scratch. So I don't, I don't want to see any people having to start from scratch. I'm hoping you can just submit your work, and, you know, have it done that way. So. You know, finish your coursework now if you can. But just, you know, just a friendly reminder that the clock is ticking and there's not a lot of time left in, uh, in this school year. So now is the time to reach out, see if you can get some tutoring help, talk to your teacher, talk to the counselors at WASA. So we are on week number two, and we're continuing our discussion of Unit 1. Okay, so OLC 4.0 is broadcast live Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday from 1 p.m. to 1.50 p.m. Central Standard Time. You can phone us locally at 1-807-737-4017 or phone the studio at 1-800-465-7144. That's uh, listening on 91.9 FM in Sulacout and other stations up north or on Bell Express View Channel 972. You can also listen to us by going to zoom.us, clicking on that join button, and entering our meeting ID, which is 417-6699-799. You can also watch these videos on YouTube. And if you're watching this video on YouTube right now, just note that there are playlists, and you can go to the OLC40 playlist. You'll see that there's a term 1B, which I taught... Um, in a previous term this school year, and you'll see term uh, 2B as well. So you can jump ahead if you need, if you need help with a specific uh, question or uh, help with a specific assignment. You might want to go to my previous lectures and go back. So look, if you're, if, you're, if you're jumping ahead and I haven't got to that with this term, 
you can always go to uh, my Term 1B lectures where I cover every assignment in this course. Please reach out to me directly through email. That's my preferred method of communication. You don't have to contact me through email, but um, my email is mlaverty at nnecschools.org. You can also find me on Facebook at Laverty Wassa. That's my professional Facebook name. So L-A-V-E-R-T-Y space W-A-H-S-A. -S -S so that's Laverty Wassa. Send me a message. Send me your assignments that way. You can phone me at 1-807-737-1488, extension 2211, or 1-800-667-3703, and that's to contact the, the WASA office. So you can ask for me, or dial my extension, or just speak to anybody who's in the office. Um, talk to a counselor if you need help charting your path to graduation, you know, or just, just talk to whoever picks up the phone, right? That, that's what they're there to do. They're there to help you. So any problems you might have with this chorus, just talk to them. Here's your next steps. I'd like you to reach out to your teacher. That's me by email, phone, messenger, etc. We've got to figure out a way that we can uh, communicate and stay in contact. So uh, just find the best way that works for you. Reach out to me, and I'll make it a top priority to get back to you. I'd like you to read the OLC 4.0 study guide and unit one and hopefully read the first chapters of our novel, Jimmy Comes Home. Okay, so here is today's lesson. We'll do our words of the day. We'll look at a headline. Our parts of speech for today will be adverbs. And I want to do a little bit of a recap on the clauses that I, I talked about yesterday. It, it's a difficult concept, so again, I want to remind students, so don't be worried if, if these concepts seem really difficult and hard to understand. Uh, and there's a reason for that, they are. So it's not you. These concepts are quite difficult to wrap your head around the first couple of times or the first 10 times. You just have to see them in different situations and practice it. And, and like I said, you know, you, you know a lot of these things. And if you can speak a language, then you understand these concepts. You just haven't put a name for it. The, the metaphor or the analogy I like to use is being a musician. So a lot of musicians are self-taught and they can't read music and they've just learned by playing along to CDs or uh, uh, you can see how old I am, uh, or just playing along to their favorite music and they don't necessarily know the names of, they don't know the names of the theory, but once someone tells it to them, they're like, oh yeah, I know that. So it's the same way with with being um, a speaker of the English language, right? Uh, speaking comes naturally, but writing is a little bit harder. So that's what I'm hoping to do with these classes, is just sort of help you understand the mechanics of the English language a little bit better. And then we'll look at assignments six, seven, and eight. So your learning goals are to learn how to use adverbs learn the definition of a dependent and an independent clause, and take notes as we review assignments six to eight from unit one, lesson two. You will practice using adverbs in your writing assignments. Sorry, this is your success criteria. I'd like you to practice using adverbs in your writing assignments. Choose a few sentences from Jimmy Comes Home and try to identify dependent and independent clauses and use the steps outlined in today's lesson to complete assignment six to eight from unit one, lesson two. And so what we're really doing here is um, with, with these like, um, with learning the parts of speech, learning grammar, learning punctuation, learning how to, uh, you know, build sentences uh, through clauses and independent clauses and things like that. We're just, we're learning how to build a sentence. And I, I that's the, that's, that's the uh, metaphor that I like to use. You're building a sentence, you're sort of remixing it, and, and that's what it's really all about. You know, as a reader, you read lots of things, you hear lots of things, you learn new words, you learn new words, ways of putting the words together, and just like a musician will learn different styles and learn different songs and make their own songs, that's what you do as a, as a, as a reader and a writer, right? So you're, you're just learning how to build it, learning how to put it all together. All right, so this is our final 
uh, grandfather teaching. It is truth. Debwewen. Truth is to know all of the seven grandfather teachings. To speak only to the extent we have lived or experienced. Commonly referred to as truth. Debwewen. Deb is to a certain extent. We, way is the sound through speech. And win is a way it is done. So, um, so I like that. It's to, it's to speak as you have lived. And speak as to what you have seen. And to not distort what you have seen and not uh, distort what you have lived. This just to speak it as it happened. Truth is represented by the turtle, as the turtle was here during the creation of Earth and carries the teachings of life on his back. And this is provided from the Seven Generations Education Institute. If we look up truth in the English dictionary, we see it's a noun. It's the true or actual state of the matter or it's conformity with fact or reality, or it's a verified or indisputable fact, proposition, principle, etc. From the old English trieth or trueth, faithfulness, constancy, uh, loyal, steadfast. So, so truth is kind of synonymous with loyalty and, you know, um, you know, saying things as they, and, you know, when you're loyal to someone, you're true to them. Um, you, if you're loyal to someone, you, you tell them what you have seen, you tell them what you have experienced, you don't distort things, you don't hide things, you know, um, you know, that's what truth means from, from a literal definition. I've got a, a similar word or a related word, true born, which is genuinely or authentically so because of birth. The king has no true born sons. And uh, here's one from poetry, a true rhyme or a full rhyme, a rhyme in which the stressed vowels and all following consonants and vowels are identical, but the consonants preceding the rhyming vowels are different. So brain, drain, chain, train, rain, slain, gain, right? So the consonants are different. So the G, R, T, C, D, um, but, the, but the A, I, N, um, remains constant, right? Uh, the word pull, we have stole, parole, whole, roll, whole, and dole, right? So that, that's a true rhyme. It's the, um, it's, it's, it's the rhyme in like the most purest sense of the word. So we don't do much poetry in this course, but uh, I like to just demonstrate how some of these, uh, how these concepts can be seen across different kinds of literacies, different ways of expressing ourselves. Here's some famous quotes about truth. From Virginia Woolf, we have, if you do not tell the truth about yourself, you cannot tell it about other people. Leo Tolstoy said, truth like gold is to be obtained not by its growth, but by washing away from it all that is not gold. And the Buddha said, three things cannot long be hidden, the sun, the moon, and the truth. So I like that. So, the, you know, the truth is sort of when we, when we wash away all of the things that are sort of unpure and all the things that are uh, misinformation, and it, it, the truth can't be hidden for long. It will eventually come out. All right, here's our article of the day. Indigenous objects repatriated from small British museum come home to Haida Gwaii. This was published last year, September 15th, 2022. Uh, we have a picture of a canoe baler. So that's a, uh, an, a you know, um, uh, an old artifact that uh, was used, I'm assuming, to bail out um, a canoe, and uh, now it's going to be sent back to um, where it was, right? It was, uh, it was housed in a British museum, and now it's coming back. So there's our headline, Indigenous Objects Repatriated from Small British Museum Come Home to Haida Gwaii. Let's review those parts of speech. So we have... Um, so we have objects, but they're not just any objects. They are indigenous objects. So the word indigenous modifies the word object. So again, I want you to focus on that concept of an adjective. It tells us what kind of objects we have. Now, they were repatriated. That's a, a new word. So I'm, I'm trying to introduce... Y you may know that word. You may not, but I'm trying to expose you to some different words in the English language. So, you know, when you repatriate something, you, you bring it back to where it was from. So when someone leaves a country they were from and live somewhere else, and then they come back to where they're from, they are repatriated. So that's a verb. It's an action. These objects were 
repatriated from a small British museum. So it's a museum, and it's, it's small, and it's British, right? So there's two adjectives that modify that, that noun museum. And what are they doing? They're coming home. We've got an adverb, which modifies the word come. So it comes home, and it's going to Haida Gwaii, which is a noun phrase, right? So prepositions are relationship words. So the objects are going from the small British museum to Haida Gwaii. And let's just break down the article a little bit here. The objects arrived on Haida Gwaii in late August from Britain, among them a heavy, intricate, argillite carving of a ceremonial feast platter depicting a rockfish and orcas and inlaid with bone, likely made in the, in the late 19th century. So we, we'll, we'll talk about this one later. That, that's a dash. So a dash is, uh, is two hyphens put side by side, right? So the objects arrived on Haida Gwaii in late August from Britain. And then we get more information about the objects. Um, and then we've got a quote. That platter was very amazing to hold, says I. I. Repatriation coordinator for San Helinde Ne, the Haida Gwaii Museum in, in Skidakade, Skidagate, BC. The weight of it, and then looking at the style of the carvings, the cross hatchings and everything, it was spectacular. So it's great to have quotes from people in articles, and I'm just forecasting to when we'll be doing our news reports in this chorus, right? So you introduce, the first, the first paragraph introduces the main idea. The second paragraph is, um, has quotes. Um, so we introduce the main idea of the story in paragraph one, and then paragraph two is, uh, you know, relevant quotes from, from, from somebody involved. Each paragraph um, fulfills a, a role in the, in, the, in the article. Each one does a specific function, right? So that's what I want you to think about with your writing, right? Each one of your paragraphs should be, should be doing something specific. There was also a painted wooden ladle, probably alder. It's difficult to tell because of its patina. And like the platter, certainly used for potlatch ceremonies. So we have another artifact described in paragraph three. Paragraph four reads, the items are part of an unusual and significant repatriation from a small museum in England's Peak District. Rather than the community asking for the items back, comma, it was initiated by the British Museum with an unconditional offer of return, right? So these artifacts are being given and they're not asking for them back. Um, yeah, so I don't think, I just, I want to move on because we don't have a lot of time today. Well, we have limited amounts of time every class, but just seeing how, um, with all of the articles I show you, all these news reports, I want you to see how the main idea comes first, you know, the most important information comes first, and then, it's not that the other stuff is not important, but it's just, it, it backs up what is said in the first part of the article, and then we get numerous examples that just sort of run with the same theme, right? And so the article is focused, it's talking about one thing in general, but it talks about that one thing through many specific and detailed examples. So that's what I want you to do with your writing. I want you to Focus your writing. So when you approach a writing assignment in this course, I want you to talk about one or two uh, main ideas, right? And then you describe those one or two main ideas with several specific and focused examples and details, right? So that's, that's what I want you to do with your writing, okay? All right, today's part of speech is the adverb. An adverb modifies or qualifies an adjective, verb, or other adverb, right? So um, they most commonly tell us how an action was done, so they tell us how verbs were done. An adverb can also modify a group of words, right? So yesterday we talked about, you know, at its core, 
a sentence is a, a, uh, an, a noun or um, a person, a place, a thing, or idea, right? So every sentence is about um, a person, a place, a thing, or ideas. And then we use things like adjectives and adverbs to modify that thing and, and to give more information about it and other things in the sentence. So we'll kind of see how that actually plays out. So here's an example of an adverb modifying a verb. My motor is running well this summer, right? So the word well tells me how the motor is running. Adverb modifying another adverb. The race finished too quickly. So we could say the race finished quickly. That's an adverb. But then the adverb too is modifying that. It didn't just finish quickly, it finished too quickly, right? Which, which, ins which sort of implies that like people weren't ready for it to finish that quickly. An adverb can modify an adjective. This house is quite cold this morning. So I could say the house is cold this morning, or I could say it's quite cold, right? So it just, it modifies it and it makes it even seem more colder. Adverb modifying a group of words. We recorded a video of the moose. So I, I could just say that as a, as a complete sentence. We recorded a video of the moose, but the adverb fortunately modifies all those words, right? So fortunately, we recorded a video of the moose. Um, if I said unfortunately, we recorded a video of the moose, it would have a different slant, but that's the way an adverb functions in that sense. Here's a little review of what we talked about yesterday with subject and predicate. So please remember that uh, uh, the subject of a sentence, um, the subject of a sentence is the person, place, or thing that the sentence is about, or an idea. And the predicate is, is what, what is said about the subject. Um, what is said about the subject, or, you know, it, it, it's what the, you know, what it, another way of looking at it, it's what the subject does. you know, what the subject does, or a, a further explanation of the subject. Here's an example from, from the article we just looked at. What is the subject? What is the predicate? The museum put a selection of items on display and asked for public feedback. All right, so the museum, that's my subject. And the predicate is what they did. They put a selection of items on display and asked for public feedback, okay? So that's from the article, right? So a complete sentence has to have a subject and a predicate. It's got to be about something and we have to hear about what that thing did or get a further explanation of what it is. All right, which leads me to talking about clauses, okay? So we're, we're, we're getting right down to the very technical aspects of the English language and figuring out how we build up a sentence, right? So an independent clause is a subject and a predicate, and it could stand alone as a sentence. So Jimmy comes home. So the title of our novel, Jimmy Comes Home, is a complete sentence. It's got a subject. It's got a predicate. It could stand alone as its own sentence. Jimmy comes home. Jimmy's my subject. Comes home is my predicate. Here's a dependent clause, right? So independent means you can stand on your own. If you're a dependent, you can't stand on your own, right? So although Jimmy came home, it's got a subject, Jimmy, it's got a predicate, came home, but it can't stand alone on it as its own sentence because the word although, it sets up an expectation that there's going to be more there. So although Jimmy came home, something, something, right? So that's something you got to watch out for in your writing, right? So if you say, you know, while I, while I studied for my English test, Something else happened. Or during the storm last night, something happened, right? So you're setting up an expectation, right? Um, you know, unfortunately, uh, I, I, couldn't make, I couldn't make the meeting, you know, because. 
Uh, here's a here's an independent clause. He did not feel welcome in the community, so he is my subject. Did not feel welcome in the community is my predicate. And if we put it all together, although Jimmy came home, comma, he did not feel welcome in the community. So, so we the the dependent clause, although Jimmy came home, is added to the independent clause. He did not feel welcome in the community, and then. We use those two elements to build one sentence. And we use the comma to join them, right? So that's one of the uses of a comma. It joins clauses together. And that's what you're doing with, um, with your writing is, you know, whether, whether you know what a clause is or not, you use them all the time. And when you understand what clauses are, and you understand the building blocks of a sentence, then you, you get a really good understanding of how to edit your work and how to make it stronger, right? And you know, I, I've introduced to you the concept of free writing and just putting a bunch of words on the page and not worrying about it making sense, not worrying about editing, not caring at all about clauses or anything else. You just get words on the page. That's the writing process. Um, you know, step two, when you just simply write. Step three of the writing process is the editing, pr is, the is the revision process. Uh, step four is editing. So revision is like the big picture stuff when you organize your writing. Editing is like uh, punctuation and grammar and sentence by sentence, word by word, really microscopic, small detail stuff. And so I think there's like, there's a part of your brain that's really good at just producing ideas and producing content, and there's a part of your brain that likes to edit and change and criticize and judge. So use the part of your brain that, um, you know, when you're writing, just write. And when you're editing, just edit, right? It's, it's kind of a nice way to, to, to set up those two expectations. All right, so here we go. Let's get into our novel, right? So... The, the novel, the assigned novel for OLC 4.0 is Jimmy Comes Home. It's written by Robert Chekwich. This is book one of the Green Star Lake series, right? So there's several books in this series. 83 pages long, uh, 12 chapters. Uh, please email me if you need a copy of the book. That's mlaverty at nnecschools.org. Okay, so what we'll do, actually, I'll go through this concept first, right? So this is a concept that I want you to understand, okay? So we're talking about information, right? So we're talking about um, the kind of information that you get while you read a novel, okay? And, and this is coming from your unit handout. So we can talk about directly stated information, and this is information that we find in the text. The information is directly stated by the author, so it's, it's, it's the words that you see on the page. And we can quote this text to answer questions and or support our arguments, or what we believe is true about the text. So, so you and I can't argue about directly stated information. It's either on the page or it isn't, right? You know, the first the first sentence uh, of the book is the plane circled Green Star Lake and came back into the wind as it approached the gravel landing strip, right? That's, um, that is directly stated. It's, it's, that's what, it, that's when you, when you're direct, you, there's no, there's, n you, it, you're, you, you're, you're truthful, right? So think back to our word of the day, right? So when you're direct with someone, they're, they're, it, you're true to the, um, the author's word it's we're just simply going on what's in the text so some questions in your assignments will ask you to find directly stated information and that's the stuff that's in the text it's stuff that you can quote so some questions asking for directly stated information will often contain these words so fine so find an example of Jimmy being angry List all the offenses Jimmy has committed. Locate the chapter where Jimmy dot dot dot. Identify the person Jimmy cares about. Tell the difference, right? So these are all um, 
sort of clues that you're being asked to find directly stated information. Now, on the other hand, we have indirectly stated information, right? So just thinking back, you know, that, that, um, that in, in front of the word, that is a prefix. So if you think back to a few slides ago, um, if somebody is dependent, that means they rely upon other people or, you know, a dependent clause has to, rely, has to rely upon an independent clause, right? So if something is independent, it's not dependent. It stands on its own. If something is indirect, it's not direct. This information, indirect information, is we find by reading between the lines of a text. The information is not directly stated by the author, and we must use our own, whoops, I spelled that wrong, our one words, it should say own. We must use our own words when using this information to support our arguments, or what we believe is true about the text, right? So, so you and I can, can debate on indirectly stated information, right? So you're reading between the lines. The author did not tell us this information. We had to figure it out for ourselves. Um, so a question asking for directly stated information will often contain these words. So predict. Try to predict what will happen. Use clues to. Based on what you know about Jimmy, think about. Review the passages where Jimmy's grandmother is talking to him. What do we know about, right? So so you have to sort of make some, yet you sort of have to make a few leaps and you have to take some of the words in the, y you're, you're taking the words of the, of the novel and then you're kind of figuring out what the author is really saying. And, and that's sort of like the joys of reading a book, right? The author doesn't tell you everything. It's sort of like a game. You've got to put some of the pieces together, right? You've got to put the puzzle together yourself. You know, to make predictions. And then that it's sort of like when you read like a murder mystery or when you read like a thriller or any kind of like mystery novel or pretty much well pretty much any novel, right? You don't know what's going to happen and your brain is like making predictions, trying to guess what's going to happen. You're trying to um trying to figure out what the deeper meaning of the story is, right? So the, di the directly stated information is just simply what happens and it's just scenes and the indirectly stuff, indirectly stated information is like the deeper meaning of the story and things that you got to figure out for yourself because they're not actually said by the author. And then there's making connections. This is information that we create by connecting our own personal experiences and ideas to the information that we find in the text. We must use our own words when using this information to support our arguments or what we believe is true about the text, right? So a question asking you to make connections will often contain these kind of words or phrasing. What do you think about? What do you do if, in your opinion, uh, you are being asked to connect your thoughts, beliefs, and experiences with the text in a meaningful way, which is arguably why we read fiction. So that's something I strongly believe, right? So when you read the story of Jimmy Comes Home, you know, what does it make you think about yourself? If you're like me and you've got two kids, you know, uh, it might make you think about your kids and what's going to happen to them in the future and hoping that they don't find themselves going down a troubled past and hopefully they have good friends in their life that aren't uh, negative influences on them. Or you might think about yourself as a young person, you know, at Jimmy's age and struggling and uh, grappling with your past and trying to figure life out, right? So um, do, you, do you connect anything from this? Uh, do you connect... Um, you know, anything from this, from this novel with your own life. Okay. So I think with that being said, and yeah, we will talk about uh, quoting the text. I, I want to just make sure I have enough time here. So, um, Right, so I think what I'm going to do here is we're just going to we're going to look at assignment six from unit one, and and and, and then I'm going to read some 
and then I'm going to read some, some of the novel, okay? So think about the title and write at least three questions. Sorry, think about the title and write at least three sentences to predict what will happen in the story. What kind of information is this question asking for? So that's really important, right? So um, you know, um, so think about the title, "Jimmy Comes Home," and write at least three sentences to predict what will happen in the story. So, is that indirect information? Is that direct stated information, directly stated, or is that making connections, right? So you're making a prediction. And I'll even give you a little hint here. If we go back to, you know, one of these slides, you'll see the word predict, right? So if we're going to make predictions on this story, um, are, are we basing our answers on the, th the three words, Jimmy comes home? Or is our answer going beyond that? Are, are, are wha and then what, you know, what kind of clues do we have, right? So you just all you have to do is make pr three predictions on what's going to happen in the story. There's no right or wrong answer here. Just looking at look at Jimmy's face, look at the title of the book. That's all you have to do is just write down three predictions. Try to write in full sentences, and tell me. Think about um, what kind of information that uh, part one of assignment six, six is asking for. You have to identify that. So. Write down your three sentences and tell me, is this directly stated information? Is it indirectly stated information? Or is it making connections? Assignment 6, Part 2. What do you think about the title of the novel? Does it suggest any connections to your own life or raise any questions? Come up with three questions you have about the plot of the novel you are about to read. And again, um, if, I'm asking you to make if I'm asking you to make connections, <laughs> to your own life, right? What is that? Is that, di is that directly stated, indirectly stated, or making connections? So you have to pose three questions you have about the plot of the novel. Look the novel over and jot down your opinions and thoughts about the following. The length of the novel, the organization of the novel, and the level of language. Uh, the words used in the novel, right? So tell me about the length of the novel, you know, how long it is. Tell me about the organization of the novel. How is it organized? And tell me about the level of language used. So words used in the novel. And if you can give me some examples, that would be great, right? Um, and just a hint for that last part, um, the level of language, if you can think about, you know, who, who is um, the intended audience of this, of this novel, right? Who would be reading this novel? What grade would they be in? Is it for adults? Is it for grade schools? Is it for middle school? Is it for high school? Is it for university students, right? So that's kind of what I'm looking for with, with that question. Okay. So maybe what I'll do, I'll, I'm just going to spend a bit of time. I'm just going to read that first chapter to you, and then we can have a quick discussion about, about some of the stuff in the novel, okay? The plane circled Green Star Lake and came back into the wind as it approached the gravel landing strip. Jimmy looked down and picked out the buildings he knew, the school, the store, his grandmother's house, and Gary's place. It was a beautiful September day, his favorite time of the year. Hunting season was coming. The mosquitoes and black flies were gone. He was nervous. It had been a year and a half since he'd been back in his home community. It had been a long time spent in juvenile detention after the RCMP had taken him out of the community when he'd broken into the band office looking for bingo money and had tried to burn the building down. Not only was that Jimmy's third break-in in five months, but he had several assault and drinking offenses. The chief and council had had enough and wanted him out of the community, even though he'd only been 15 at the time. Jimmy had been in a lot of trouble with the band constables and RCMP since he was eight years old, and they said there was little chance he'd change if he stayed with his friends at Green Star Lake. Most people had been relieved to see him go, but what he remembered was his grandmother, crying at the airport. 
lot of information in that in that first paragraph of this of this novel. So you get a little snapshot of of Jimmy. So we see that this this story is not written from Jimmy's perspective. It is um, it's written about Jimmy, and it's sort of like a narrator who who sees Jimmy and tells us what Jimmy is uh, doing and what Jimmy has done. We don't really get Jimmy's direct thoughts, so it's not written from Jimmy's point of view, so that, that's important to keep in mind as you read through. Second paragraph, his new probation officer was sitting beside him on the plane, and they had been talking about what Jimmy would be doing when he got back home. The magistrate had released him from detention on the condition that he go to school. His probation officer had been instructed to contact the school at least every two weeks to make sure that Jimmy stayed in school and kept making an effort. The twin-engine prop plane hit the airstrip and Jimmy heard the familiar sound of gravel striking the bottom of the plane. It slowed and taxied up to the small wood wooden building that was used as the airport office. Are you ready, Jimmy? His probation officer, Frank, asked. Jimmy told him, sure, why not? But inside, his stomach felt nervous. He sat in his seat and wished the plane would take off again. He would have liked to have just stayed on the plane until it took off again for Winnipeg. Come on, let's go. Frank looked at Jimmy and knew what he was thinking. It'll be okay. So there you go. That's that's the introduction to the novel. Um, you know, Jimmy has finally come home, and now we're going to see, you know, what lays in store for him. All right. So in the in the next uh, set of questions, you uh, you were introduced to the rap rock model for answering questions. So you restate using words from the question to begin your answer. Then you answer the question. Then you prove using ideas and examples from the text to support your answer. You relate. You make connections to yourself, other texts, the world itself. You provide your opinion by explaining what you think and why you think it's true. And you conclude by wrapping it up with a good ending. So we're going to see how that works, right? So. Um, assignment 7, part 1, asks you, where did Jimmy spend the last 18 months of his life, and why? So using the rap rock method, you could say, Jimmy spent the last 18 months of his life, dot, dot, dot. You answer the question. Um, you could prove that by using ideas from the text. Um, and you don't have to use all six, right? So sometimes all you have to do is restate the question, answer the question, and then prove it. And then for the, for the longer, more detailed writing assignments, then you may want to, um, you know, relate, make connections to yourself, provide an opinion, um, and conclude it. So question two, assignment seven. How does Jimmy feel about being home? Use clues from the text to answer this, right? So that's where you've got to um, restate the question, right? Jimmy felt, um, Jimmy felt, you know, uh, blank. Fill it in. Upon returning to the community, so and how do you know that, right? So, so restate it. So Jimmy felt blank when returning home from the community, um, and then you answer it by filling in the blank there. So he felt, you know, was he happy? Was he excited? Was he nervous? Was he scared? Was he angry? Then you prove it by um, quoting from the from the text directly. Um, or, or just simply saying what he was feeling after you read that first chapter. Give your opinion of Jimmy, the situation he is in, and any interesting comments you may like to share with your friend, trying to make them, you know, you're trying to make them read the book, right? So, uh, so assignment seven, part three, is you're telling your opinion of the book, and you're trying to get your friend to read it, right? So in that sense, you know, you've got to provide an opinion um, about Jimmy, provide an opinion about um, the book itself and you know this book is really interesting this book is relevant to people living in the north this book is something you should read because right so then prove your opinion as you are reading the text this is question four in a, uh, part four assignment seven as you are reading the text was there a point where you paused to think about something in your own life or something that you have read or watched before use two of the during reading make connections to explain uh, using full sentences, right? So these are the prompts, right, that you can use. So I already know about this text reminds me of, 
this compares to, this text is different from this because of that. This section made me think about, right? So you, you, you can use those prompts if you want, or you can just simply say, you know, when reading Jimmy Comes Home, I was reminded of a scene from my childhood, or uh, this, this novel reminds me of another book, or maybe this novel reminds you of a story you've heard, or a movie you've seen, or a story you've heard from someone else in your life. Um, so maybe it's, it, it could be similar to a story you've heard, it could be different to a story you've heard, um, either a true story, a story from your life, or one that you've heard. Part 5 of Assignment 7 asks you to sketch the main ideas in the chapter into a four-panel comic book strip, right? So stick figures are more than okay. So we've got people waving here. We've got... Um, this is my awesome picture of an airplane sort of landing. Here's the landing strip. Maybe Maybe this is like the guy with like the... Looks like he's holding hot dogs, but it's meant to be like the flashing like light thing so he's sort of like the tarmac guy and there's the wooden building that's the airport office right so use your artistic skills if you got them but if you're like me just do your best and just make it into a four panel comic book strip right so you can do it on one page and just do four strips uh four panels and for one strip assignment seven part six Complete the following phrases as best you can based on your predictions about the text and the thoughts and ideas after reading the text. Based on what I have just read, I now realized that Jimmy... Dot, dot, dot. The evidence that supports my thinking is that you know Jimmy said this or Jimmy acted this way or the it, it you know is that you know you know Jimmy has a probation officer or you know something like that. I can now conclude that something something all right so look back at your predictions and just see if they were right or wrong um i think um you know and because i read about this i now know that right so that's use those prompts so so write out that sentence as you see it and then add your own words after the dot 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 all right assignment eight after reading after reading ask questions what can I ask to help me better understand this text? Um, uh, what does the writer mean by why did, didn't this, uh, what have I learned, I wonder if, right? So this is after you've read the text, after you've read that first chapter, then you can you can ask some of these questions of yourself, right? So, And you can use the, the rap rock model, right? So restate, use words from the question to begin your answer and then answer the question, right? So, um, and so you're using these prompts, right? So the most, and you're selecting three of them, right? So um, the most important thing I remember about this text is, the main message is, the text was mainly about uh, clues, words, and features that helped me understand the text were, or um, the message of this text is, the purpose of this text is these ideas relate to blank because this text may be biased because this text doesn't deal with um, you know dot dot dot. So you you got you got to pick three of those prompts and then um, and then fill in the blanks in a sense, right? So. Um, Yeah, so you've just got to pick those prompts and just and just sort of uh, and and you don't have to use them exactly as they appear in in your unit handout. You can like slightly change them or uh, you you can change the wording a bit if you need to. But that's th they're 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 prompts. They're they're meant to get you to start thinking about you know ways to write it. So probably the easiest would be you know like the main message is. Right, so what's you know what's the main point of this story? What is it really about? You know, um, this you could say this novel is about. Um, right, so you know, restate, use words from the question to answer to begin your answer. So this this novel 
is mainly about so you restate it and then you answer the question right so this novel is mainly about right and that's where you put your proof you put your evidence kind of questioning my ability to spell here right yeah proof is two o's um uh, you could quote or cite the text here. Right, so this novel is mainly about, and then you, you give your answer. It's mainly about this idea, and then, you know, you, you prove it, and then you provide your opinion and then conclude it, wrap it up with a good ending, right? So I'm hopefully hopefully that makes sense. Um, just trying to think what else I can say here, right? So again, I mean like the, the main thing with, with these with these kind of questions is like there is no there there are no right and wrong answers. These are your thoughts on the novel. What I'm trying to do here is just to get you to express your thoughts in in full sentences right that uh uses the text as evidence right so just use those prompts as a way to start your question so the most important thing i remember about this text is and then just simply fill in the blanks right tell me what tell me what the most memorable thing about this text was for you so so what is it about what stands out the most to you um or you can also uh, so you can ask some questions you can so you can ask questions about the novel so I you know I wonder what's gonna happen to Jimmy when he um, you know I wonder why Jimmy didn't dot 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 um, or you're finding the main ideas in the text this you know w the main idea of the text the 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 moment or the scene that you found to be the most important and that last category is how do I put it all together, right? So um, that's probably the hardest one to do. If you're struggling with this question, I would focus on the first two, like finding the main idea, the most important scenes, and just simply asking some questions about the novel, um, you know, making some more predictions, right? So even after I've read this, so even, even after knowing this, I'm still wondering what's going to happen to Jimmy, what's going to happen to him as his story unfolds. So that's all the time we have for today. Thank you for tuning in. We will pick this up tomorrow and finish off lesson two.